Welcome. What a great night to be together for this Christmas Eve celebration. I see that we have a large crowd of people assembling now. Why don't we try and meet some of them and see what excites them about being together tonight? Come right on up. I'm so glad that you're here tonight. What excites you about being at this Christmas Eve service? Well, that's easy. I'm here because it gives me a chance to show off my new trendy clothes that I purchased just for the season. <laughs> Notice the advent colors of purple and pink. I have joy popping out of this as I sport this fashionable attire. I am ready to deck the halls tonight. Well, I think we have another guest. And why are you so excited to be here tonight? I'm here because I want to display my vocal abilities. I come each year to let people hear the blissful sounds of my melodious talent. I have been doing scales all day to prepare. Just listen. Oh. Have you heard anything like that before? Uh, no, I don't think so. And you, sir, come on in. I don't want to be up front. Can I stay in the shadows? Why have you come to this Christmas Eve service? I'm here because it's kind of a written rule. You have to bring your, church, your family to church on Christmas Eve. I mean, I took the kids to the Christmas parties, the parade, to see the newest Christmas movie. I have to fit in a little religion somewhere. It's been a year since we were here. I would probably doom to some hot place, if you know what I mean, if I didn't show up for Christmas Eve service. Well, it is good to have you all with us tonight. What is the most special thing about being here? Oh, I'm here to show off this fabulous new belt with adjustable length so I can eat more at the reception after this program and still look fit and trim. I'm here to show everyone that I can sing soprano and bass at the same time. <laughs> Joy to the world and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing. I'm here because my wife won't speak to me for months if I don't bring the kids to the service. And the church might put my name on some kind of inactive list if I don't attend at least once a year. No, I mean, is there anything special about this night that brings you here? Pearl accessories. Loud singing. A short sermon. <laughs> Wearing high heels that lift me physically and emotionally. A solo in the middle of the service by me. An empty seat on the back row. A new handbag with sequins that shine like the star of Bethlehem. A seat near the front where everyone can see and hear me as I sing the hallelujah chorus by myself. A dark corner where I can catch about 30 minutes of shut eye so I can rest up for getting all the presents wrapped at home. Can I tell you why I'm here? Well, I'm not quite finished interviewing these people. They still might have something important to share. Oh, yes. oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention. I, I think, think the church is going to let me be in the choir. Stop, stop, and stop, and stop, stop. And stop. And Everyone do. stop. Maybe we should listen to this young man. I'm what here. is special about this night to you? I am here because God sent his only son to be born in a little town called Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. He is the Messiah and is the Savior of the world. I want to worship him today. Of course. Yeah, 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 knows yeah. That. I'm thank you. Yeah. Exactly. You are so right, young man. We are here to celebrate the birthday of Jesus. Thank you for reminding us of that important reason for the season. Oh, come, 
All you unfaithful, come. We can unstable, come. No, you are not alone. Oh, come, barren and waiting ones, weary of praying, come. See what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. <clears throat> oh, come, bitter and broken, come with fears unspoken. of his perfect love oh come guilty and hiding ones there is no need to run see what your God has done Christ is born Christ is born Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for that powerful reminder of why we gather on an evening like this, on a, on a time of year where so many people are in visiting family, so many other things we could be doing. We have the opportunity to be here in your house to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we realize that we all come from, a, uh, from maybe a different emotional place or maybe we have the different reasons for being here. Some of us may be here excited about Christmas. Some of us may be a little depressed this year. And maybe some of us, frankly, don't feel like being here. But Lord, one thing we all have in common is we have a reason to be thankful. Because of your son, Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity for eternal life in your kingdom. So Lord, may our focus for the next hour or so beyond that alone. We thank you so much for the, the gifts you've given, for musical ability this, this evening that has just been a powerful way to get our minds and hearts focused, for the skit that reminded us of, of why we're here. And Lord, we ask your blessing on the rest of the service as well, that all that is said and done and sung and spoken here would be for your honor and glory. 
again, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing with us, What Child Is This, in your red hymnal number 110. I'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the night, or excuse me, in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty God will accomplish this. You can stay seated for the next one, Silent Night, 
We're going to sing it from our blue hymnal instead, number 193. I'll be reading Luke 2, 1 through 14. In those days, Caesar Augustus is issued a decree that a sentence should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph's, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth into Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and in the line of David. He went there to be registered with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in the manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. 
Please turn to 100 in your red hymnal and stand and sing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. <laughs> And I'll be reading from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. I'll be reading 1 through 7. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. 
His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so through him all men might believe. And I will be reading John 8 through 14. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but he, his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of the natural descent, nor of the human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I love that John 1 passage that you just heard because to me it reminds us of the simplicity and the personal touch of God's deep, deep love for us. It speaks volumes for how much he really, really wants us to take our place in his kingdom, to take our place at his table. But how could that ever happen if it wasn't for Christ, the one whose birth we're, we're about to ring in? You know, John 1 talks about the Word. And when people pick up this book and they give it a long look, they have one of a number of different responses. Some people are annoyed. Why should I allow my life to be governed by a set of nitpicky, outdated rules? Have you ever heard that one? Some people feel skeptical. How do I know what's written in here is actually legit? How do I know the God that it talks about is real? Others feel confused. Well, how can I follow the commands that are in here if I don't really understand everything that's being said? And many of us feel discouraged. I want to do what God has asked me to do. I want to follow his commandments, but there are so many of them, so many guidelines and I am prone to fail. How could I possibly keep each one? How could I possibly do all that is expected of me? Well, hopefully it comforts you to know that you're not alone in thinking these things. If you fall in any of those categories, those questions and concerns have been raised all throughout the course of time. And Jesus even took the time in Matthew 22 to address some of this stuff. When he took this entire book, and he narrowed it down to what he said would be the two most important and most, and the two greatest commandments. And both of them surrounded, are surrounded by this concept of love. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus would conclude with this very interesting statement where he would say that upon these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. And to understand what that means is incredibly significant. The Old Testament opens with the Torah. What we know are the five, first five books that lay out the law. All those standards that God had set for us. And then the Old Testament closes with a collection of works from the prophets. Those who, whose duties were to re-offer the promise of hope of Jesus. And sandwiched in between the law and the prophets is a rich history of people just like you and me that realized they could not live up to that flawless life laid out in the law and therefore needed the salvation that would be offered by the Christ child foretold by the prophets. When Jesus says that all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments of love, what he was saying is that everything the Old Testament teaches Everything we are to live by can be accomplished if we follow these commands 
of love. And I've taught that before here in our services, that if you think of the relationships that you have that mean the most to you, and that should be easy as I look around and I see a lot of people surrounded by their families, the people that they love the most, their spouses, their children, their parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends. You know that it is out of love for those people that you automatically want to do the right things, wanting to protect them from harm, wanting to look out for their good, wanting to be kind, wanting to be faithful, wanting to be true, as true and full of integrity as possible. And those characteristics make up the basis of the law. So if we want to be decent human beings, how do we criticize the law? And so if we master just, if we just master this concept of love, we would be much more able to abide by the commands of scripture than we currently are. But if you're like me, you don't do this as well as you should. And so time after time, we fall short of achieving the glory of God. And much like our Old Testament ancestors, we find ourselves broken and in need of deliverance. And that's where John chapter 1 comes in. That gospel opens by saying, the word became flesh. Typically, we would, when we hear the word in the Christian context, we're thinking of the word of God. Everything we just talked about in the Bible. In which the greatest command is love, of which we all fall short. And so the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy of the Savior's arrival had everything to do with God becoming flesh and blood, living among us, becoming as one of us, in which Hebrews says he basically went through everything we all go through. And while doing that, he loved the way we are supposed to love. And he demonstrated the life we are supposed to live. And then he would die the death we were supposed to die. And in doing so, he gave us the offer of, offer of eternal life that we were otherwise not supposed to have. That's what God's love is all about. That's what happens when the word loves us enough to become flesh. And when we fall because we can't withstand or we can't do all these commandments, he picks us up and he carries us the rest of the way. He loved us enough to live among us. And when you think about it, that is a lot of love. Because we knew that he knew how that earthly life would end. I mean, who would, live the glory of, who would leave the glory of heaven to die a gruesome, horrific, painful death? But one who loved us the most. The one who saw people like me who struggle with sin. And he knew that what he would have to do to remedy that. And he was willing to do it. He was willing to die an excruciating death so that we could live in a glorious life and one that would live eternally. And one that would last for all eternity. And you say, well, Pastor Eric, that sounds a lot more like an Easter message than a Christmas message. But who says they have to be separated? Because the humbling truth is, without Jesus what he, doing what he would do at Easter, the Christmas message is completely meaningless. It was because of what he would do on the cross that we, we could have hope of new life and salvation. It was because of what he would do on the cross that we could have joy when, when sin stole every other reason we would have for that. It was because of what he did on the cross that we could experience true peace, even as we observe a world that does not share that sentiment. And it was because of what he did on the cross that we could witness a love so strong that the vilest sinner could experience eternity and glory if they just come to Jesus. That's why that building excitement we've been talking about over the last several weeks and what we heard this morning, it was finally released when that star appeared in the sky. And those who saw baby Jesus, they weren't ooing and aahing over a cute little baby. They were celebrating that the victor, the savior, and the king had finally arrived. But it would be another 33 years until that plan would be complete before he would be able to say, it is finished as the victory over sin would finally be sealed at his death on the cross. But still, those who knew God knew that this baby was the one God had promised. 
and that was enough for them to celebrate. And so I think the final video of the series that we've been watching will say it all. We'll go ahead and play that now, please. By the time the star appeared, the weight of darkness and the price of sin had left many of God's children coming and going, but not living, praying and practicing, but not worshiping. So it was just one more cold night on just another midnight clear before the sun would even rise when light overcame the darkness. Angels filled the empty skies Trumpets and harps, music and melody, soul-shattering song broke the silence of a thousand generations and the hopelessness of the captives fled without looking back. Cascading down from the unseen heavens, bending near with unfurled wings and God's bright glory, the heavenly hosts announced the words that changed the world. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. So without pause, the shepherds rushed to see. Just a few that night, but they carried all of humanity with them. And there they found a stable less ordinary, and a manger less regal, and a tiny babe wrapped in cloth less royal. But still, he seemed even brighter than the very star that pronounced him. Here on earth, peace, and from God, goodwill toward all people, Glory to God in the highest. Christ, the Messiah, has been born, the Savior of the world. Please turn to your red hymnal number 93 and stand and sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
You may be seated. Indeed, Christmas has arrived, and that's what we celebrate today and tomorrow. But the reason many churches partake in communion at Christmas time, which is a tradition I love, is because the joy of Christmas is made complete by the sacrifice that that once baby in a manger made on the cross. We celebrate Christmas because of the new life made possible by that little child in a manger. But it wasn't his birth that gave us that new life and that eternal life, but it was his death. And so for that reason, I do believe that the remembrance of that sacrifice is an extremely fitting way to close out a Christmas service. And that's why we're going to do it this evening. It would be some 33 years later that Jesus would gather with his disciples around the table for one final time on that night before his death. And, and he would have that solemn moment that was recorded in Luke 22, starting at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink of it, the fruit, from the, vine, the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said to them, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So at this time, if you would find a piece of bread... You can say with me, this bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Picking back up at verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves who it might be who would do this. Did you find your cup. And then say with me, this cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. <clears throat> and we know the story doesn't end there, of course. If we fast forward the story just a little bit further, we know that, in fact, Jesus did rise from the dead. 
And then he encouraged his disciples as he encourages us to go into all the world and share his light. So as we do our final song, Ken and I will be coming down the aisle with light from the Christ candle for you to light your candle. And just a general rule of safety, please, whoever has the unlit candle will be the one that tilts it. Because if you tilt the lit, lit one, uh, you can imagine that that might not be a good thing. So please tilt the unlit candle toward the lighted candle. We'll be down the aisle and we'll light the inside of Rose and you just pass it down the aisle. It's on page 129 in your red hymnal. And then we get to the last verse, which there's three verses. We invite you to stand at the last verse.
Let's turn to number 92 and rejoice with joy to the world. <clears throat> Wish you the merriest of Christmases and whatever your celebrations may entail. May the joy of the Lord be with you throughout the whole thing. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.